Um, I think I should be able to move this right along because Anna covered some of this yesterday, but I just wanted to say this is uh, when Philip was talking earlier, it really kind of struck a chord with me about kind of getting excited about the work we do. And this is to me one of the most fun projects the bird crew is doing and for several reasons. One is that it's documenting kind of effects of what you guys are spending so much time doing on the ground. But these surveys are really fun. Um, we never know what we're gonna get. I'm talking about non-breeding season surveys. And so every day is just kind of a surprise and I hope everyone else feels that way when they go out to do their field work. Um, so I'm just gonna give you an update about some of the, um, the the surveys we've been doing in our shrubby draws. If I happen to say drubby shaws, that's kind of what we call them out of affection, and I, it, just so you know, that may happen during this talk. Okay, so here we go. Here's the ranch, and we have a lot of shrubby draws on the ranch, um, as you're familiar with. Here's kind of, uh, we've got like Tongue Creek right here, Sheep Camp here. Um, these are linear features on the, on the ranch. They, they function a lot like a riparian system. They vary in, in their size, um, and they provide connectivity between, um, at least for wildlife species, um, between the floodplain and the upland conifer forest. Um, they're very isolated though in many ways and um, the matrix surrounding them is grassland or what was formerly known as grassland and um, so most of the wildlife and birds that we see using those are actually moving up and down them as opposed to going across the property. Um, there's very little woody plant cover in some of what we're calling shrubby draws so the, these kind of um, areas circled in yellow. Um, we have extensive erosion and invasive plant cover in some of these places. But we actually do have some pockets of great vegetation in some of those and uh, water sources, which are a great benefit to wildlife. So there's a lot of variability and we think each of the shrubby draws that we are sampling kind of captures the full range of what the potentials could be. Um, we like them or we want to encourage the development to allow for movements of these kind of large charismatic species that we don't actually see that often but would love to be free flowing around on the ranch. And we also like them because they, um, they serve ecosystem purposes like in theory <laughs> retaining soil and moisture in the uplands and for you avian science center people, this is your banding station. It's now under quite a bit of gravel and sediment after our runoff this spring. Um, we are doing a lot of work to make these better. A lot of you are doing a lot of work. So we're planting, we're irrigating, um, stabilizing banks, spraying, burning. And um, at some point we wanna know how, how are we doing? So the bird crew is, uh, is using birds as a response variable to these treatments. And uh, one of the reasons we're doing that is kind of compared to say a, a wolverine or a wolf, um, birds are relatively abundant. There are a lot of them, there are a lot of species. Uh, we can observe them passively. We don't actually have to catch them. Um, they're present in all seasons, as you'll see, to varying degrees. And uh, birds often have specific habitat needs that you can tie directly to vegetative structure. So some of the goals for this project is we want to document bird activity at special times of year. So as you heard yesterday, not that the breeding season isn't special, but Anna's already studying the breeding season. And um, uh, the non-breeding season is uh, relatively understudied um, for most wildlife and, and bird populations. Um, so we want to know what's going on during migration and then for overwintering species. Um, this will allow us to evaluate our restoration treatments and um, we are testing that technology that Anna talked about, about mapping these things directly on aerial imagery on an iPad. So these are pretty like lame um, pictures I have of our advanced technology, but um, we are using an iPad um, to document where these species are occurring on a, even a plant by plant basis, which is a very small scale relative to how much work is done. So we go out there and um, we are walking basically, the, for the most part, the edge of these shrubby draws. So we don't want to be down in there moving things around, affecting behavior. Um, in some cases, we've picked a few corridors where we actually cross it to get to the other side. That allows us to actually, because as you can imagine, if it's super shrubby, um, our detection probabilities could be quite low. I mean, there's birds moving around there that we physically can't see. So we do, um, we have a strategic route to cross to allow us to capture some of what's going on in those dense areas and then to get us to another side. Um, but we're all following the same routes every time we do it. And then when we detect a bird, um, we can click on its uh, bird's location on the imagery. So this is a young white crowned sparrow in the fall sitting in a hawthorn up by the Tongue Creek Spring and that's kind of what it looks like on our screen. 
and then we get this interface that allows us to um, input different attributes. So it's also storing attribute information, which is really nice. Um, so not only what the species is, if we can identify if it's a male or female, its age, um, what it's using, so substrate's really important, and um, what it's doing. And so this is our output. These are like all the dots that we've ever collected. I don't even know what these colors mean, but they actually show you quite well what our routes are and what areas we're working in. So um, for discussion today, these, these draws are a little bit different. Um, some of them overlap with ANA sites and some of them don't. So we are working in Sheep Camp, both forks of it, Tongue Creek, and then we've added Partridge Alley to the mix because so much restoration work is going on there. So what have we learned so far? Um, I did present on this project at last year's conference, um, but for those of you that don't remember or didn't come, um, I was focusing mostly on our fall data from one season. And last year, just with one season's worth of data, um, we were able to show that we could detect um, both spatial and temporal patterns in bird use of these shrubby draws, at least during fall migration. So here's just a few recap um, pictures. So this is looking temporally and as the beginning of the seasons here in August, and as we go from yellow to blue, the season progresses. And so we see a lot more of those lighter colors down low, those areas without established vegetation, and more of the darker colors um, as the season progresses. So areas like this in Upper Sheep Camp were busy through the whole season, but areas like this, this lower part of Sheep Camp, were only busy early in the season. And part of that is reflective of the actual species that were migrating at the time. So during fall migration, we did see temporal and spatial variation even by species. So this is really, I mean, this is, this is stuff we kind of expected, but you don't really get to document that often. So we have some of our open grassland species like the Vesper Sparrow, and here's our shrub, uh, shrub species, the spotted towhee. They're early season migrants. They pretty much come through in the beginning and then they're gone. We have uh, robins here in the middle. Um, their peak really coincides with a, when a lot of the berries are ready um, for consumption. And then we get into some of the late season migrants like the dark-eyed juncos. We were really, really only picking them up at the end. And here's what they look like on the landscape. So we've got those early season vesper sparrows down here, robins clustered up where all the berry shrubs are in water. And the juncos, for the most part, were kind of up here in the upper areas. Uh, spotted towhees, really dense. Um, these are the same areas kind of where Anna was picking them up, high breeding densities of towhees. Okay, so now we've completed surveys in three seasons, and uh, we can start to look at these data to see if, well, do we see different species? Um, we would expect so, since a lot of the, the species we're seeing during migration actually are migrating away from us and or coming back to us, so we wouldn't expect to see them in the winter. Um, but do we see any difference in draw use between seasons? And uh, do we see any differences from year to year? And so some of these questions are, you know, like how do, what are we managing for? Do we want these draws to be good habitat just in the breeding season? Do we want them to be good habitat year round? Um, and how can we use some of these data to inform what we might want to do in the future? Here's just a recap of our, our survey effort. So we've done surveys in two falls, two winters, and just one spring at this point. So we're just getting started for this year. Um, the main differences are we've added partridge alley in the winter of 2013, so that wasn't sampled the first fall. And um, we really felt like we were missing some pieces of fall migration with our sampling period the first year. So we actually extended a week on either end. And, um, I'm really wishing we had done the same in the spring if any of you have been out in the ranch in the past couple of weeks. I mean, the numbers of migrants moving through right now, specifically of robins and the bluebird species, is unbelievable, and juncos too. Now, not all of them are actually using the draws. The juncos sure are, um, but we've missed that at this point, and um, I mean, you can't sample all year, so we just have to decide at some point. That's where we're starting and finishing. So we're gonna start that on April, the week of April 1st. Just so you can kind of understand what the birds are actually doing. So this is different um, than in the breeding season where they're you know, focused on the territory, they're trying to raise young. Um, in the fall, these birds are heading to overwintering grounds. Um, we get a, a, a good population of adults, but we see tons of juvenile birds. So these are all the babies of the year. Um, they're, you know, this is their first time migrating and they're passing through. Um, th these birds are not territorial. Um, they're looking for things like uh, leaves, fruits, seeds, and water. These are the kind of resources the draws are offering them at this point. Um, what's driving them in some cases could be climate. 
Um, but these birds are kind of coming through in waves and um, not necessarily sticking to the spot. We don't really know how long they might use a draw, but the thought is, you know, they may be there a day or two, but then they move on. So in the winter, we get primarily overwintering and resident species. So we'll get some birds that only show up here in the winter, um, like a tree sparrow. Um, we see a lot of horn larks. We suspect that actually most of these larks are from the Arctic and our larks are going somewhere else. We don't really know, um, but their colors are sure different. Um, we get a good mix of adults and potentially juveniles. Again, these birds aren't territorial. They don't have to maintain a territory because they're not trying to raise young. And they're pretty much moving around. I don't want to say randomly, but um, the variation from day to day is really high because they're just moving around looking for resources. At this time, we often don't have any water um, available, though there is some in some places. Um, you know, there's no leaves for cover on the shrubs, and, um, but a lot of them are finding seeds on the ground. In the spring, um, we're seeing migrating birds. These now are ones heading to breeding grounds. And rather than concentrate in places like the shrubby draws, a lot of them are just trying to get to a breeding territory as quick as possible. So we see fewer numbers. We've seen this in our acoustic data too. The spring migration is much more dispersed and not as related to say a big weather event. Um, again, we'll see adults, but at this point in time, many of the babies have died. So um, we may not see as many juvenile birds. And some of them, like, um, some of them are actually starting to be territorial even as they're moving through. So we get these waves of, say, spotted towies, and they're already singing, even though they may not actually stay here, um, but they are starting to be a little bit territorial. We start to get leaves back on the shrubs. We've got water. We've got seeds that are left over from the winter before. OK, so now I'm just going to show you some results. This is a really great one to watch out for right now. So we've got spotted towies migrating through the property. It's a gorgeous bird. It's got this fantastic red eye, and their song is pretty distinctive. And um, even though they're kind of a, they like to lurk around in the shrubs when they sing, they can be pretty easy to see. Um, I'm pretty excited about this. Across all of our surveys and across all of our years, um, we've seen 97 species in the shrubby draws. And we've mapped the location of almost 7,000 individuals. So our species list for the ranch, you know, for all time is a little over 200 species. So we've literally seen almost half of them in the shrubby draws. Um, this um, figure is kind of showing you species richness. It's really kind of hard to compare all of these because the sampling effort was a little bit different by season and even within season. But I just point out that we are seeing the most birds in general in the fall and the most species in the fall. And, um, and conversely, we see the fewest birds and fewest species in the winter. We've gotten some really good detections. Um, this is actually, I saw, I got to see these two, uh, two sage thrasher detections. That's a bird, it's a sage, sagebrush obligate. Um, I think the closest records are from over in the big hole. It's a bird that's hardly ever, I don't know if it had ever been documented um, in the bitter before, um, but this was in two areas of, of Plum Creek and in both times it was in a hawthorn. So, you know, people would tell you, oh, you only see them in sage. Well, this one was using our hawthorn and I think we got one in August and one in October. October? I can't remember, but weeks apart. So I don't know if it's the same bird, but probably not if it was a migrant. We also, um, this winter was pretty fun. Uh, Kerr and I both ran into short-eared owls. Again, that's a species. Debbie has found a nest. We see them occasionally. And at least on this one day, Kerr and I each saw short-eared at roughly the same time in two different draws. So they're making um, good use hunting the draw edges and uh, seem to like it in the winter. Um, the top birds for all of our samples, who are they? I'll give you a hint, it's not a waxwing. Does anyone have any guesses for the top five? Chickadees, no. I'll give you a hint. Um, the top bird is actually our top bird in the summer too. Vesper sparrow, okay. Any other guesses? Think of what's really common on the ranch right now. Toys is not, not during the fall, spring, and winter. So yeah, I think fall, spring, and winter here. Horn larks? No. No, I have to try to remember Tree what they sparrow. Tree sparrow, yes. All right, I'll go through them. 825 Vesper sparrow detections. Vesper sparrows are a grassland breeding bird, and um, it is phenomenal to me that we're finding these in our shrubby draws. Now, they are in the less shrubby areas of the shrubby draws, but that's not a place you'd expect them, really. Robins, OK. Again, I love robins, and they really like the shrubby draws. Um, this is a really cool one. So this is a migrant. Wow, white-crowned sparrow. 
Um, they don't breed on the property, they don't overwinter, but man, they pass through in huge numbers in the fall and we see a lot of juvenile birds. This one's really neat because um, if you pay attention to the bill cover, it gives you, or bill color, it gives you an indication of where, um, where they're from. So their bill color varies from orange to pink. Okay, these are the little winter cuties. Um, if you see any of these around now, you're lucky. We've seen just a few that didn't um, leave when all their friends left. These are the tree sparrows, um, really common in the winter. Um, distinctive, they've got this bicolored bill, so it's yellow on the bottom. They look kind of like a chipping sparrow with that cap, but they also have a dark dot on their chest. So um, if you guys know where the maple tunnel is as you're going up Tongue Creek, they were all through there all winter. So if you saw little flocks of birds, they were probably tree sparrows. The last one, the starling. Now, their numbers are really boosted because, uh, you know, there's just a couple clumps of cottonwood, particularly in Tongue Creek, that just big groups congregate in in the spring. So um, they don't actually breed in huge numbers in the draws in the summer, but at least during spring migration, there are a lot of them that hang out. So here's our species with more than 100 detections across all locations and all seasons. And so here's our top five. Um, I put the ones in, in bold um, that aren't really found in the draws during the breeding season. So you can see a lot of these are um, kind of unusual to the draws. You know, we have a house wren or two in there, um, but that's not the place we see them breeding the most. So things like the kinglet, um, that's a conifer forest breeder. Again, really wasn't expecting to see them in the shrubby draws. So if we kind of break it out by season now, um, I kind of kept the species colors the same so you can see if you see them in different seasons. So we've got fall, spring, and winter. The only bird that we picked up um, in high numbers in all three seasons was the gray partridge. So that's a non-native species. Um, kind of mixed feelings about them. They seem to do really well in the shrubby draws and their ecosystem service, I guess that you could say they provide to us is they make great food for a lot of our predators. So that could be things like foxes, but also a lot of the things like the harriers that we see hunting the shrubby draws. Um, you'll see like the robins are only really there in the fall and spring. Um, I was surprised, I mean, again, we only did one um, spring season. So these numbers are just low, but you know, only 700, 754 in the fall and only 71 in the spring. And that's partially because I think the Vespers get to the ranch and they are just out in the grasslands the day they come, you know, setting up their territory. So they're not really interested in cover at that point. I had to throw in a few um, pictures just to fill it in. If any of you aren't aware of what a gray partridge looks like, um, again, that's the one we see in all seasons. Um, the horn larks we see in the greatest number in the winter. I mean, these flocks can be hundreds hundreds of birds um, strong and it's actually quite a challenge to count them and actually if there's not snow to even see them as you'll see in some of my later pictures. Meadowlarks, um, we did catch or we did get a few of them in the fall but we're predominantly seeing them coming through in little groups in the spring. And then here's some uh, young yellow rumped warblers. This is a forest breeder um, and we saw quite a few of them coming through our shrubby draws in the fall. So um, one of our questions is, did draw use vary by season? And um, you'll see, I have a series of, of um, images like this, so I'll just kind of tell you how I, I laid it out. I was really struggling with how to present these data because um, I basically broke down the draws into 400 meter sections. So when you see one, that's the section here, two there, three there, et cetera. And, um, we are basically assuming that every draw has the variety of options a bird could want. So these numbers of here, up here represent the proportion of the birds we detected in that draw that were in any one of those sections. So hopefully that makes sense. And um, so again, here's P1 corresponds to P1 here. So generally these numbers go up draw, though in the case of Partridge Alley, we did a little loopy around. So uh, it actually goes back down draw. And, um, then I put some little pluses and minuses on here um, that correspond with the color of the season that is just kind of show you um, parts of the draw that were especially maybe good or bad based on number anyway at different times of the seasons. So, you know, this part of Partridge Alley was really good in the spring and pretty much this whole section, we hardly ever saw birds. 
and so it gets a double negative um, for two seasons anyway. This area with all the cover gets double positive. Here's Tongue Creek. So again, Mike, I can't remember, what were you calling? Is Mike in here? Middle draw. Middle draw, okay. So we included that as part of Tongue Creek because it's actually just really easy for us to walk down it and then come back up Tongue Creek. This is really surprising to me because it actually has some good vegetation, but it was a negative <laughs> in all three seasons. And you know, if it, we don't really know for sure. This is like one of those places where maybe a radar unit would help. But if the birds are primarily moving up and down the draws like this, and this just basically dies right here and there aren't any birds coming down it. Maybe that's a reason why it's, you know, we're not getting a lot of species there, but I would have expected at least some birds moving up from the floodplain. Um, so I don't know if that's really reflective of the structure in there, but for whatever reason, we're not seeing any birds in that section. Um, interestingly, um, this area of Tongue Creek gets a lot of use in the spring and the winter. Um, that's where you guys have put in a lot of the erosion bars and there's a lot of exposed soil, there's a lot of erosion, and um, that place is just, I mean, especially with the tree sparrows um, and horn larks and things, they really like it. Um, here's sheep camp. So we're gonna go from one up to seven, and then we walk the road, and then we start sampling as we come down. This, is, this whole north fork of sheep camp, we really don't get that many birds in. So if you remember from yesterday, this is one of Anna's really good spots for anyway spotted towhee breeding. And I don't know, I mean, it's just not getting much use for us um, in any of the seasons, but in the winter, it's particularly bad. I mean, it's really much a, a really dense wall of it's nine bark or something in there. I don't, you know, so there's, I don't know why, but there's just not a lot of bird activity in there. And even around, we've got that little isolated pocket of cottonwoods. We don't really get much there. Um, maybe we got the chuckers there, some partridges, and that's what a lot of the numbers in this area were, were um, non-native game birds. So what we are seeing is some sections have high use in all seasons, some have low use in all seasons, and some are mixed. Um, so you know, as we're thinking about what we want to do with restoration and what we're restoring for, um, maybe one strategy would be to emulate those areas that seem to have high bird numbers um, and, or fo and focus our restoration efforts on the ones that have really low numbers in multiple seasons. Um, and so what we want to know is what's making those areas good. And um, we're in the middle, or I should say just the beginning <laughs> of a veg, um, really doing the veg cover analysis. Okay, what is on the ground? We know what we're seeing, but um, let's put, that, put some numbers onto that. I really wonder about the presence of water. So Mike brought this up yesterday. Um, you know, we've seen, especially in the spring and fall during migration, you know, if we have a water line break or some sort of water leak, the birds are all over it. It's like they're waiting in line to access the water. And that um, at those times of year, I mean, that's just something else we could consider having more water leaks or, you know, or putting water sources in some of these places. No, Mike's saying no. Just depends what your, your goals are. Um, but we might want to add water. I mean, this stock tank around sheep camp, I mean, it, it's great for several reasons. This is where we get some of our highest activity in sheep camp. It's surrounded by hawthorns and, and things with berries, this dense cover. And then they've got this great water here. There's all the chipmunks running around. Um, it's a really nice spot. Um, but so maybe if we offered water in some of the other places with shrubs, um, maybe that would be a good thing. Um, and then the other thing we can do is actually look at some of the substrates that things are using. Um, so are they, is the substrate use varying by season? And, and yes, it is. You can see here, again, the seasons are all in different co colors. Um, shrubs are important all the time, and that's what we would guess, um, but it's nice to have the data to support it. Um, the ground, many more birds are using the ground in the winter, and many more birds are using the grass in fall and spring. You know, in ground and grass, what's grass, what's ground is kind of like, well, I'm not sure like how we're all sampling the same way. So, I mean, we could look at those as kind of being similar. The areas that have a lot of bare ground, the only cover that's there usually is grass. Um, so um, that substrate seems to be really important, but it also seems to be a substrate we're trying to get rid of. So we could think about, um, I don't know, maintaining it in some areas. And I think, um, well, here's just some pictures of birds using their substrate. Anyone recognize this guy? is a fall migrant, one of our top birds, that I said its um, bill color varies based on where it's from. White crowned sparrow, okay, this is the young bird, so it looks very different from the adult. I don't know, I can't remember off the top of my head. 
<laughs> somewhere north, um, using the Hawthorne in sheep camp. Um, this one is kind of fun. This, so this is one of the challenges we run into. This is the fall picture. Um, the robin's kind of obvious in this picture, but the tree is also full of <laughs> juvenile wax wings. So I had my nephew help me with this slide, see how many he could count. Okay, so there were a lot of birds there. Um, so they were using actually dead aspen in sheep camp. This is what we get a lot of in the winter. Um, so there's actually a pretty big flock of horned larks on this hill, and I just zoomed in on some of them. Um, they're really hard to see, they're really hard to count, but they really love this bare ground. And they really um, seem to love it on those highly eroded south-facing slopes that are the only places that are warm and without snow at certain parts of the winter. Um, so that's a really good resource for them, and they really love it when Dan's crew spills seed from the top of the crested areas down onto the tops of these eroded hillsides. So um, here's a tree sparrow, another one of our winter birds. So there's one there and one there. You know, these birds um, usually make a lot of noise, but a lot of these flocks foraging can make surprisingly little noise. Um, so they're a real challenge to count. Um, have we seen any differences between years yet? So we've only really done this a couple years. And um, as you guys may know, uh, migration things, there are so many factors that could influence how many birds are passing through or using the property. So I don't want anyone to think we're making any huge statements here. Um, but we've done a lot of work just in the past couple of years. And uh, you know, can we see any, anything um, coming of it? Well, we can look at a couple of things about migration and compare the abundance, phenology, and species richness in the fall. Now, we did add Partridge Alley as a site um, in 2013. We didn't have it in 2012, but its actual length of area surveyed is really not that much more than what we had. And it wouldn't account for this difference. It would not totally account for this difference. So almost you know, 3,500 birds counted in 2013 and just over 1,000 in 2012. So something went on. We had a lot more birds moving through in 2013, and I would, n I would not say that that's the result of our restoration treatments. That would be wonderful if it was, but it could be something as simple as, hey, you know, it was a warmer summer, there's less mortality, or more, more breeding success somewhere else um, translated that into more birds coming to MPG. Um, the species, but the species richness was also higher in uh, 2013. Um, the kind of peak of migration was later, and um, again, like I said, the, there are several reasons that could be and that may very well not be related to the habitat we hope we've created. Um, here's just a look at some of our species. In 2013, 2013 I just had to cut, cut these off at 100, otherwise you wouldn't have been able to see any, anything going on here at the bottom. Um, but the white crown sparrow, which is this blue, I believe this number is actually like 184. So white crown sparrows just did awesome, and we captured, you know, a day when a lot of them moved through, compared to our, you know, our peak days in 2012 was just a little over 20 birds. Um, same with vesper sparrows; their numbers were super high. Again, though, they are migrating early in the season. I think that adding on, we didn't do this first or last week in 2012, so we picked up a ton of birds just by adding a week to our surveys. Um, and things like the junco, again, are later in the season. So a lot of the trends of when individual species are moving through are quite similar, though the numbers are really different. We can look at um, Tongue Creek and Sheep Camp, which were both surveyed in the two years, and kind of look at some differences um, between the two years. Again, I don't really want to say too much about it, but um, here in 2012, you know, we saw a lot more use of this lower area than we did in 2013. And these two areas are, are related, but we saw more up here in 2012 and more down here in 2013. But the birds, we've noticed, so we kind of surveyed this, do a loop, and then survey down. In 2012, for whatever reason, we were getting tons of sparrows perching on all of Dan's exclosures. It was like the place they wanted to be. And this year, we still got a lot of sparrows, but we also got a lot of juncos, which are kind of ground guys. And they were all um, bouncing back and forth from this to this to this to this. So a lot of them are using that spring right there and the hawthorn that's right there. It's just it seems like they were coming from different places to get there in the two years. Here's sheep camp. Um, 2012, 
you know, some more activity in here, 2013, some more activity in these places. So again, you know, there's nothing strong that we can say about this yet. This is going to take a few years potentially to sort out what are migration dynamics and what are responses to what we're seeing on the ground. Um, did this, these are things that have changed though quite a bit, Sub the amount of and types of substrates in some areas. So um, in winter we were seeing between the two years quite a few more birds than 2014 on the ground and more birds on shrubs um, in 2013. You know that could be again a lot of things like the day we went out whether or not there was snow on the hillsides or not or what the snow depth was. Um, in the fall really similar patterns. Um, again, more things on the ground um, at that time. So just in conclusion, we have um, at this point mapped really specific um, fine scale locations for thousands of our birds in the non-breeding season. So that's, I think, quite um, an accomplishment um, and the contribution to the, our heritage program and just what we know about when species are doing things. Um, and that includes um, several unusual species and many species that don't actually breed in the draws. Um, we saw that our abundance in species richness was greatest in the fall compared to the other seasons. And um, different species were using the draws in different seasons, not a surprise. Um, the areas that had the greatest use vary by season. So again, if we're trying to figure out how to focus areas we want to restore, maybe we want to look towards those areas that were bad much of the year. Um, and their substrate use varied by season. And uh, abundance location and substrate use varied by year within the same season. <laughs> okay, and thanks. Um, thanks to the folks that did. Um, Debbie, Kerr, and I really, um, I feel like we did most of the field work equally, but those guys were out there and excited about this project, hopefully as excited as I was. And um, to Anna for all our help uh, working with the iPad and just uh, talking over concepts. So I think there's time, plenty of time for questions or discussion if anyone has anything. So thank you.